good everybody welcome back to the cloud slayer channel hope you guys are doing well tonight or and or in the morning man whenever you're watching this but uh, we're gonna have another reaction video it's gonna be the sad truth about hygiene hygiene during the victorian era um, this one is capernicus's capernicus's galaxy ho ho hopefully i said that right but if you uh if you enjoy this video hit that like and subscribe button uh let's jump into this bad boy in the 19th century, the United Kingdom went through a notorious era that nearly everyone is familiar with. A period of time that saw the transition from a country completely dedicated to agriculture to a fully industrialized one. It was commonly known as the Victorian era and was ruled by Queen Victoria I for 64 years. Unfortunately, this era was not as we currently imagine it. Not everything was long dresses of fine ornate fabric and dances to show them off. This period was much more and not exactly for the better. Due to the early age in which the advances of medicine were found, this era could be defined more by the stench of its streets and its inhabitants that populated them. Today, we will learn how the ladies of that time dealt with their own smell and at the same time tried to look their best. Welcome to Copernicus's Galaxy. How did Victoria can probably uh, imagine, you know, they didn't really have like soaps or disinfectants or anything like that you know they didn't really have like the manpower to figure out like you know medicine type stuff you know plagues plagues would suck right Koreans go to the bathroom in their big dresses the pleasure of wearing a beautiful and stunning dress has always brought about a series of problems for women especially when it comes to tending to their needs. But any of them will tell you that the effort is worth it, and it is undeniable that those ruffles made their beauty stand out even more. Now we have all kinds of dresses, short dresses which reach the knee, or even some that seem designed to mop the floor. There are tight-fitting ones and some that are quite loose, with or without a neckline. Depending on the style of dress you choose, it will give you some problem one way or another, which in some cases is a challenge of ingenuity and skill to use the bathroom. However, the ladies of the Victorian era did not have much choice. Because of the length and heaviness of their dresses, women in those days tried to eat, drink, and exercise every day at the same time to try to get their bodies used to expelling in the mornings or evenings, by which time they would usually be out of their beautiful but annoying clothes. In spite of this, the body is capricious, and there is always a day when, even with all the previous training, your bladder or bowels let you down. Therefore, for. The best kept trick for those ladies was a wide underwear that had no crotch. It was for like those rich uh, women back then, you know, when they're younger, they probably had, like they said, very strict training, you know, um, probably beaten, you know what I mean? Beaten by mistresses, mom, or whatever, you know, to force them to do that, you know. So they didn't have much choice. Just those around you had high expectations and. You didn't have the same rights, you know, they could just beat the dog shit out of you. Divided so that if the maiden urgently needed to go to the bathroom, she could do it just by lifting the long and heavy skirts, adopting the typical squatting pose. Now, if in order to relieve themselves, they needed both hands to lift the dress, how did they clean themselves afterwards? The answer is quite simple. If the lady had only urinated, she did not bother to clean herself. And if drip dry, brother, drip dry. <laughs> Uh, people joke about it, but that's what they used to have to do, right? She had defecated, she excused herself with some ailment, and left to be able to clean herself. Toilet paper did not start to be produced until mid-century, but nobody wanted it. They thought it was throwing money away together with excrement. Europeans preferred to opt for having a bidet, which was a kind of pot or bench with water and a sponge to clean themselves, while Americans used to use magazines and newspapers, or even cut and moisten corn cobs. Victorian women used their own. Uh, that's a fun fact. I never knew that, you know, from back then. Corn cobs, old, uh, newspaper, they thought it was something like throwing away money. It makes sense, you know, even like my grandmother, she wasn't that old, but she was old. She's old Korean lady, right? She came, uh, married my grandfather from Vietnam there, Vietnam War. And she, she thought toilet paper was, a, uh, you know, just throwing away money stuff like that so i mean that ideal is still closer than we thought especially when they came from a a different era you know even just my grandparents uh rest in peace to those guys own urine to wash their laundry 
Until the 1880s, there were no washing machines to soak, scrub, rinse, and wring out our dirty clothes for us, let alone dryers to get our clothes clean in less than two hours. All these steps had to be done by someone, which was no easy task. For a small farm alone, the washerwoman would have to wash approximately over 150 pounds of laundry, first filling the kettle with about 20 gallons of water before lighting logs placed underneath to heat it. Once boiling, the dirty clothes would be put in. And they just had like, uh, one, like the regular housewife back then was had a greater bone density than, you know, our superstar athletes of today, you know, and there's good reason if they had to do this on a day to day basis or, you know, they were probably strong as fuck. Big ass, you know, big, strong women. And then for 15 minutes, they would be stirred with a special paddle up to three feet long, which required a strong arm to use. As you can imagine, there were no products such as detergents or softeners to restore the color of their old garments, which forced Victorian women to do their best to preserve the white of their dresses. Some manuals of the time even recommend repeating the rinsing step up to three times to get rid of stains. The best laundromats had their own secret concoctions. That's crazy, man. That's a lot of work. Um, just, just thinking about it makes me tired. To remove any kind of dirt while those victorians who preferred to wash clothes at home tried literally everything to achieve the same results from sour milk to remove iron oxide from white clothes or ox bile liquid freshly extracted from the animal at the butchers to help preserve the colors to their own urine that served to whiten any procured garment thanks to the ammonia in its composition honestly we don't know if that really counts as washing <laughs> yeah if you rub it and pee <laughs> to avoid going through this type of process. well if they went through that process so many times you know the first once or twice could have been urine or something like that to get it out or whatever the idea was then washing it final finally for that last step or whatever two two times who knows process so often. They used underwear that covered most of the body, thus protecting the wool and silk garments from body fluids such as sweat, gaining a couple of more uses before sending them back to be soaked in foreign substances. The Victorian Dentist From cuttlefish toothpaste to sulfuric acid Although people of the Victorian era really cared about keeping their teeth as healthy and clean as they could, the reality is that with such primitive dentistry and the lack of toothpaste, you'd most likely find that the vast majority would sport a yellowish or hollowed out smile. It was advisable to brush the teeth with Castile soap, a paste, powder, or liquid dentifrice that was commonly scented with rose, mint, or vanilla essence. But many preferred to make their own homemade recipes that included chalk, camphor, quinine, so <laughs> Imagine using talk, chalk, coral, alum, and even charcoal the latter was not one of the most um we, we kind of use charcoal to uh, today you know and like toothbrushes bristles infused with freaking charcoal recommended but became extremely popular due to its incredible work whitening teeth unfortunately in the long term it inflamed the gums and caused periodontal diseases dentists offered a bleaching service in which they applied chemicals such as oxalic acid dilute nitric acid sodium chloride or potassium cyanide solutions which were very harmful to any surrounding tissue if not applied by a qualified specialist some fell for the lies of pilgrim dentists who offered a product that cleaned the teeth immediately leaving them shiny white but lost their teeth when they became black and extremely sensitive after a few days due to the sulfuric acid present in the solutions oh people get uh selling that fake shit and fucking people up man uh that's why you can uh, trust con men con people back then not just men i guess used by the false dentists as for how toothbrushes came about the story goes back to 1780 when william addis was in prison for looting during his confinement he found no better way to pass his time than to create a toothbrush out of calf bone which he drilled holes in at the top and filled with boar hair attached to a wire after his release he began marketing them as the first mass produced that's crazy a lot of these people <laughs> uh, make things out of prison you know like who was that elon musk uh, decided to do what bitcoin or something like that uh i can't remember what the heck yeah but he, he created whatever after prison right and this dude makes fucking decides to make toothbrushes in prison that or somebody's garage toothbrush a victorian woman's beauty routine 
The women of these times used to take only two full body baths a month. The other days, they simply washed their hands, face, armpits, and crotch with cold water and vinegar. Those people of low income only often had a small basin and a jug to wash themselves. The tubs with hot water were reserved for higher social strata. Since shampoo did not exist as such, most people washed their hair and body with the same soap which left both their hair and scalp very dry, so it was recommended that they wash their hair at least twice a month. To keep it shiny, they used treatments based on ammonia diluted in water, which was highly corrosive, or onion juice, which had a powerful and unpleasant odor. Given the few baths that could be taken, the most effective way to- I thought people used more animal fats, but I, I'm wrong, you know, I don't, I obviously didn't study any of that stuff. Camouflage the body odor of sweat and dirt was to spray liters of perfume. A popular one was the ambergris fragrance, created from liquid recovered from the intestines of a dead sperm whale. To have perfect skin was also an issue for Vic- <laughs> Yeah, he said sperm whale. <laughs> I know I need to grow up, sorry. Victorian women. For this, they had cosmetics that did their job quite well, but at a high cost. Most of them were made with lead, which clogged the pores, causing a lethal mineral imbalance. Those with freckles were recommended to rub lemon juice or even carbolic acid on them and then take a sun bath until the freckles burned off. <laughs> Fuck all that. <laughs> this caused premature wrinkles, which in turn were treated with slices of raw meat before going to sleep. The stereo. What? <laughs> Slept that on my face real quick. The type of beauty in the Victorian era was a woman who was neither too thin nor too obese. And of course, they had their own treatments. The ones dedicated to weight loss being the most harmful because they contained potentially deadly ingredients. What a stench. The day the park- I'm sure they had their mi miracle weight loss pills back then. They always had that shit, you know, or the, the keep you young forever type shit. Parliament almost left the capital. Let's imagine the unpleasant aroma that surely most of us have had to breathe when passing a garbage dumpster for just a few seconds. Now let's combine it with the stench coming from a sewage canal. Ready? Disgusting. Right? Now multiply that at least by 10 and imagine that it is omnipresent. It is everywhere and at all times. That right. That was That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, that makes you, you know, appreciate your garbage people more, you know, for sure. That was the essence of London during the 19th century thanks to a bad plumbing system that caused leaks and threw everything directly into the Thames River where excrement to animal carcasses and even humans were stored in its depths. This also combined with a poor sanitation. Can you imagine how bad that would smell? of its streets was a major source of infection. The inhabitants of this city learned to live with it in the same way they did with their own stench and that of their neighbors. To mask the odors, they used to use perfumes in abundance, but unfortunately this did not work on hot summer days when the intensity of the sun and the exponential increase of the city's inhabitants accentuated the putrid aroma. During this period, some people still used a well system in their bathrooms, where their waste was stored until someone had to take it away. That was the job of the gong farmers, who usually worked at night so as not to bother people with the foul smell they gave off from their work. In 1858, significantly low water levels were re Oh, we don't want their already smelling, their shit smelling place to smell even more shittier recorded in the River Thames due to evaporation, leaving huge banks of muddy debris exposed to the heat. This forced members of Parliament to consider fleeing to Oxford or St. Albans because of the pervasive stench that reached them firsthand as they were situated right on the river's edge. In the end, this event was necessary for the city government to invest in better sewage. Honestly, we need to be thankful that today we have decent sanitation processes and a facility to maintain our hygiene and health that any man or woman of the Victorian era would envy. Although, Frickin' I, I lived by uh, an incinerator out in Faustin. Ooh, that whole town stunk, man, I tell you what. Especially when they were in working hours. But you can only imagine that. It was, like, way worse over there, you know, at, at this time and in that era. Holy man, they didn't have anything cleaning anything, you know. Who knows? Maybe in the future, people will see our habits and cleaning systems as not very efficient. We will see what the technological and social advantages to come will offer us here at Copernicus's Galaxy. If you like the video and you are passionate about history and other intriguing facts, 
oh man that was a pretty good show um if you guys have any other suggestions suggestions for me to react to uh please put them in the comment section down below i'm down to watch whatever uh, oh man it, it's fascinating you know uh you take a lot of these things for granted i know i do um from time to time but you know it's it's good to uh, watch those things and be like dang man this is the reason why we have to do this you know we gotta fight fight off diseases and various things like that and you know you don't shouldn't take these things for granted you know i do know people that still make their own soap and stuff like that which is fucking awesome and you know <laughs> god bless them when they get that stuff out so especially when they make like an overabundance you know so um well i hope you guys have a great one peace